I used to drive trucks in the military, so when I left the service, it was only natural for me to step into driving cargo all over the United States to make an income. I've been just about everywhere in the US, and because of my background, almost nothing scares me. I've driven through backwash towns so desolate and isolated that one could easily imagine that the residents peeping out at you from their windows were mutated cannibals. I've driven roads so icy and treacherous that Antarctica would be jealous, and I've been stranded in the desert with several flat tires after running over someone's metal debris in the dark. I still have no idea how someone lost so much scrap metal and didn't notice. Suffice to say, I'd never felt scared whilst driving alone on the road, or at least I hadn't until recently. I was driving through a desert in Utah. It was late, and I knew I was in for an all-night haul. The road itself was long, dark, and empty, but I noticed I was seeing weird uh, objects along the side of the road at regular intervals. Now when I say objects, what I mean by that is, occasionally, there would be a dead tree that happened to be close enough to the road for me to see that had what I thought were strings weaved into its branches. The strings were vaguely in a pattern, I guess. They reminded me of spider webs, and more often than not were items tied into the pattern. I thought I saw animal bones in a couple of them, clothing or maybe just torn cloth, skulls, bits of random junk and hair, like a horse's tail or really long human hair. I couldn't tell which. Each one was different, but they all had the same feel to them, and seeing them as often as I had made me a little uneasy. The last one I saw was two dead trees leaned over the road that were connected by strings, like some sort of entryway or theme park gate or something. After I drove through that one, there weren't any more. Now don't get me wrong, Driving through deserts at night, you get used to seeing all sorts of weird shit normally. But I wasn't going to stop to examine these things just in case they were some kind of trap. Hell, for all I know, they could have just been some modern art on display. Either way, I wasn't taking that chance, and since I was working towards a deadline anyway, I really didn't have the time to stop either. So don't bother asking me why I didn't stop and take a closer look. You have your answer right there. I first noticed I was being followed sometime after I saw the last tree art uh, voodoo thing. I had driven past an animal carcass that was large and mangled. One thing you should know is that to help pass the time while driving, I've made it a game to try and identify a roadkill. I'm usually quite good at it, but this one was different. So incredibly mutilated, I, I couldn't tell what it was. Because of this, I was squinting in my rear and side mirrors, trying to figure it out before I was too far away from the light of my truck to see it properly. When movement farther back caught my attention. It wasn't anything overt. It was just that in the distance, I could see a dark shape traveling in the same direction as I was. I could see it because the road and surroundings were a pale color, and the moon was full. It didn't have any lights, which I found strange, because it seemed large. I thought it was maybe a car, but it never got any closer or farther. It just stayed the same distance away, ominously following after me. I checked on its progress regularly, and it's safe to say, its presence is what spurred me on to my destination. I even arrived about an hour early. By daylight, whatever it was had gone. I don't remember specifically seeing it go, but I do remember noticing its absence with relief. I came to the conclusion that it was probably someone up to something nefarious, perhaps a drug cartel car, traveling at night, without lights to avoid being seen or something of a similar nature. After that job was done, I took a couple rest days in a lovely little town. I had a blast of a time, nursed a vicious hangover, and took up another job scheduled for later in the week. When I got back on the road, I had entirely forgotten about being followed. I drove along, making good time towards my new destination. But as the sun started to set, I got an uneasy feeling. That primal gut feeling that something is about to go down. That's what I had. I 
glanced around nervously, and sure enough, following behind me, was a dark shape silhouetted against the road. It was closer this time, but still not enough for me to make out what it was. By now I had ruled out that I could be a car because of the way it moved, slightly up and down, similar to the gait of a creature, I thought, rather than smooth like a vehicle. I spent so much time watching it that I swerved off the road in more than one place and made myself so nervous that I resolved to stop at the next town's gas station and wait for it to pass me. Luckily for me, the next town wasn't too far off, and once I was inside a building in the presence of other people with a warm beverage, I felt much better. I waited an hour, but whatever it was never passed the gas station. I figured eventually that it may have turned off a different way, and I was probably starting to look like a creep sitting in the corner, so I hit the road again. I was barely on the road for more than ten minutes before I saw it again, silently trailing after me at the same distance and pace it had been before. I couldn't believe it. I ended up cracking up the radio and chatting over with some other late night haulers for some comfort. After that night, I started taking day jobs. Deliveries that could be made during the daylight hours were now my preferred. Unfortunately, they're also everyone else's preferred, which means they're much harder to get. I have an ex-wife and two kids to make payments to, so the money I make dries up pretty quickly, and within a few weeks I was running short on cash. This was what forced me to take up overnight hauls again. The first night was uneventful at first. The moon was by now considerably disappeared, which made the night darker, but I didn't see anything following me. I took this as a good sign rather than allowing myself to realize that just because I couldn't see it, it doesn't mean it wasn't there. It was a little after midnight, and I was driving under an overpass headed into a city. The road was completely empty, but the streetlights that were spaced out along the top of the overpass meant my surroundings were better lit for a time. Out of general curiosity, I made the mistake of looking in the mirror to see behind me. Illuminated, as it too passed under the overpass, was what had been haunting my nights. For the first time, I could see with relative clarity what it was. It was horses. Two black horses, with two cloaked figures riding them. My jaw dropped. They weren't close enough for me to make out any fine detail, but I could tell for certain that they were horses, and that they were moving far faster than should have been possible. When they were out of the light, they disappeared from my view, as the night was too dark. The only thing that tore my eyes away from the mirrors was the sound of my truck wheels leaving the road again. For the rest of the night, I kept my eyes dead ahead. I didn't want to look back and see how close they were getting, and I didn't want to miss anything ahead of me that might, by any horrible chance, cause me to have to stop the vehicle. Only when morning came did I stop the truck. I was a third of the way to my destination. It was going to be another two nights drive. I broke down. I'm a grown man, and I'm not afraid to say that seeing those horses and those figures chasing me, knowing they'd be chasing me for weeks, steadily getting closer each time I drove, was too much for me to handle. They don't teach you how to handle the paranormal at boot camp. I got only a few hours sleep before setting out again. I thought I could leave early and get most of my driving done during the daylight hours, and pull over when night came. I might be a little late to my delivery, but that didn't matter to me at this point. However, my best plans were disrupted by the plague of road work. The road I had planned to take, which I had calculated would get me halfway to my destination in the least amount of time, and before the sunset, was closed off. Instead, I was rerouted down a dirt track which slowed my progress considerably. As dusk approached, I felt a knot of fear in my stomach. I wondered how close they'd be this time. The moon was almost gone. I wondered what would happen when they finally caught up to me. I concluded I didn't want to know. Then, up ahead, I spotted a figure walking alongside of the road. I'd seen enough of these types of people in my time traveling, 
so I knew immediately that it was a hitchhiker. Normally, I don't pick them up. I have places to be and who knows what kind of a person he'd be letting into your truck. But this time, I was so desperate for company that I did. The kid stuck his thumb out and I pulled over. He was young, early twenties from the south, apparently heading north on the trip of a lifetime, as he told me, and his name was Marcus. Marcus talked fairly consistently as we drove and was getting too excited for my tastes, but I didn't mind as much as I normally would have. Having the constant chatter was a welcome distraction from the pursuers. I knew what was coming with the nightfall. Once it was dark, I kept my eyes focused ahead. I wasn't going to look behind me this time. I didn't want to know. We were only an hour into the dark before Marcus suddenly became quiet. I looked over to see he turned in his seat, staring back out the window. Without looking at me, he asked in a shaky voice, Can you drive faster? I set my jaw firm and pressed harder on the gas. I knew he could see them. In a way, I was glad. Part of me considered that I was going crazy from the long hours or that I had developed some sort of PTSD-induced hallucination. It was at this point that I couldn't help it. I needed to know how close they were. My eyes flicked to my side mirror, and what I saw will haunt me until the end of my days. At first there was nothing, just an empty road lit periodically by the overhead streetlights as we drove. Then suddenly, I could see them. Riding beside the driver's side of my truck, and visible in short glimpses, I could see a single horse with a rider. I guessed the other must be on the passenger side. The horse I was seeing was emaciated and rotting. There wasn't any blood on the animal, but it ran on broken hooves, and the rotted away flesh had fallen off in chunks, leaving patches where one could see that its tendons were snapping back and forth over the bones of its legs. There wasn't any steam or anything coming from the horse's nostrils, though they were flaring with effort, and its eyes were not demonic red as I had been expecting. Instead, its eyes were gone. I imagine they were gouged out long ago as the sockets were just empty but covered over with skin. The rider itself was by far the worst part. It looked like an old woman gone mad, skeletal with bony fingers clutching the reins, long hair blowed back in thinning clumps and a cloak made of what looked like human skin. Her face was equally as horrifying. She too had gouged out eyes, but somehow I could have sworn she made eye contact with me in the mirror and smiled. A wide, gruesome smile full of cracked lips and decayed teeth. I'll never get that image out of my head. I held eye contact too long in petrified fear and woke up the following day to a dripping sound in a hospital room. According to the official reports, I'd fallen asleep at the wheel and driven off the road. There was no other passenger at the scene, dead or alive, or any trace that there had ever been another passenger in my truck. I don't know what happened to Marcus. I shouldn't have dragged the boy into that. Maybe they took him instead of me. Maybe I was hallucinating that I'd picked up a hitchhiker due to lack of sleep. Maybe he was thrown from the vehicle so far they didn't find his body. The speculation swarmed in my brain, but I had no answer. I also didn't know what those ghastly things were or why they started following me. All I know is that it's daylight now, and I can hear the sound of horses' hooves galloping on the road, and the sound is steadily getting louder and louder. Those things won't stop until they get me. That's the only thing I know for sure. Be careful out there, everyone. Next time you're driving late, remember what could be out there. Ignore the glimpses you caught of something unnatural in your mirrors and don't think about what could be following you. It only encourages them to chase. After my accident, I spent only a few days in the hospital, and my injuries were what you'd expect. Whiplash, scrapes, bruises, a couple of cracked ribs, and a bumped knee. 
It was recommended that I stay longer to be on the safe side. The doctors were absolutely convinced that I had some sort of head trauma after I told them what happened, but I wouldn't have it. No way, no how was I going to lay in bed all day, watching bad TV and eating food of questionable origin while those things were getting closer. I could hear the sound of hooves on asphalt coming for me. And since I was able to stand, I figured I was probably alright enough to leave. Of course, I didn't know if I was just imagining hearing them or not. I was on some pretty strong painkillers after all. Either way, the medical staff were lucky I didn't just leap up and rip the IV lines out and bolt for the door. They took their time in preparing my release forms, and as I waited impatiently, I silently willed them to hurry up. When I was finally permitted to leave, I made a beeline for the nearest bar to drown my sorrows. I didn't know what I was going to do anymore. My truck was totaled, and I was either having some very deranged hallucinations, or those things were probably still after me. I will admit that by the time I made my way to a shitty little hotel room for the night, I was seriously contemplating ending it all. I sat in defeat with the barrel of a gun to my temple for a long time. My palms were sweating and my heart racing as I considered my commitment to this course of action. However, it was in that moment when I was about to pull the trigger that I heard the most beautiful sound, the screeching of car tires taking off outside. It brought me sudden clarity. It was as if the road was calling me, and I know I wouldn't do it. I still have things to live for, namely my two beautiful kids, Gracie, my little angel, and my little man, Lachlan. I couldn't do that to them. They were only six and eleven. They still needed their father, and, and I'll be damned if I let some old prudes riding decrepit horses get the better of me. It may have just been the liquid courage speaking, but... I was suddenly filled with rage and valor. I wasn't going to let these things stop me from living my life. I was going to drive so fast that their damn horses wouldn't even be able to keep up. They'd be eating my dust if they tried to keep chasing me, and I was resolute in my decision. By morning, my head ached, and my spirits were somewhat dampened as I realized the colossal amount of work I had ahead of me to get through this. First on the agenda was to get the insurance claim back for my truck. I had filed the report while I was bedridden in the hospital, and it was time to give them a reminder, and made sure that I was going to get my money quickly. It did take some arguing, but in the end, I was told I just needed to wait a few more days, and that the money would be in the bank by the end of the week. Next, I needed to get back home, and spend a little time with my kids, and let my family know most of what had happened. I planned on leaving out the chased by a horse hag part though. I wasn't willing to hitchhike after what had happened to Marcus, so I went online and found an affordable rental car. It wasn't anything flashy, just a small sedan, and since I knew the insurance money would be coming in soon, I didn't mind the small expense, as long as it got me where I needed to go. I figured I might even be able to claim back the rate. Now, of course. I stuck to driving during the day for obvious reasons, but by the third day of travel, I was getting impatient, and I knew I'd make it home that day if I just drove into the night a little. I debated with myself for a few hours, but when the time came and it started to get darker, I didn't pull over. I guess I made up my mind without really knowing it, and they'd be eating my dust, right? That's what I told myself anyway. However, Despite my self-assurances, I found myself anxiously glancing up at the back mirror more and more excessively as the sun disappeared. Although I gradually began to relax, as even after a good amount of time passing, I still saw nothing. I would look back only to see the road deserted behind me, and I found comfort in the slight relief that the empty road would give. The idea that I might really be crazy began to edge its way into my mind. It made sense. Maybe there never really was anything chasing me. Perhaps I never picked up a hitchhiker. What if none of it truly happened and I had just fallen asleep at the wheel after all? That suggestion surprisingly put my mind at ease. It seemed somehow better to be crazy than to be haunted. I assured myself to lull into the renowned sense of security. 
It was just about nine at night. I'd be home before midnight and I would see my kids tomorrow. Everything was fine. That was until it wasn't. I had been driving through a wooded area, with my headlights illuminating the area immediately before me, as well as a little ways further. I scanned the road ahead, diligently making a pattern of looking right to left, then back again, at regular intervals, as I became less and less concerned with looking behind. The sound of my car's tires on the road was somehow soothing, and with the trees beginning to become sparse, I knew the landscape was changing. The reflective signs ahead informed me of an approaching bend in the road, and I adjusted my speed appropriately. But as I went around the corner, a big rig passed me, going the opposite direction, and despite my best efforts, I found myself mildly dazed by the bright lights. I recall thinking how I now knew what the other cars felt like, and my truck went past them, small and blind. However, while I was blinking with purpose to diminish the orbs of light floating in front of my eyes, I saw a dark shape suddenly there in the glare of my headlights. It was incredibly close to my vehicle, and I hardly had time to process what it was as I swerved to avoid colliding with it. I came to a sharp stop, and as the dust swirled around my car, I tried to determine what I had just seen. I looked back and around only to see nothing but the eerie blackness of night. The thing was gone, but a realization sank in slowly and chilled me to the bone. From recalling my brief glance, I came to know that I had seen a horribly decayed horse. With ears flat back against its head and nostrils flaring, it had lifted its rotting front feet off the ground to rear before stomping back down with force, while perched on the thing's back was the withered creature of my nightmares. The hag just smiled at me with chapped lips in a hollow darkness and those empty eye sockets. She wanted something from me. In the split second we had made eye contact, if you can call it that, I could tell she was trying to communicate, but what she wanted I couldn't say. I waited tensely for something else to happen. I had a Glock 19 in the glove box and resolved that those bitches weren't going to take me without a fight. A few long minutes passed before I decided, screw it, I'm just going to drive. I slammed the car in gear and tore off down the road like a bat straight out of hell nothing stopping me or dragging me back, but I didn't care to look behind me either. When I reached the next town, I stopped and checked into a room for the night. I only had a couple more hours to go before I'd make it home, but I wasn't going to keep trekking on after that experience. The night was a restless one, and at some point it occurred to me that if I drove home, I might be leading these things back to my family and to my kids. I couldn't have that. I needed to keep them safe. I then spent the rest of the night wondering what the old crone wanted. She and her demon horse had scared me off the road. I had sat there for a decent amount of time and then drove off. If they wanted to take me, they could have. They didn't. Why? By morning, I thought I had my answer. I only needed to test the theory. I got in my car to drive and started driving. I didn't have a destination, but I had a plan. I drove for hours, and as the sun began to set, I started to feel a little uneasy. It was a nervous sensation, though very keyed up, like I was about to be deployed into combat. By my good fortune, I managed to spot a hitchhiker walking along the side of the road. They were putting their thumbs up for each car that passed, and having no luck, so I pulled up near them. Hey, do you want a ride? I asked as I rolled down my window. Hey, uh, yeah man, that'd be awesome. The guy repeated eagerly. He looked like he was in his mid-twenties to me, and had a kind of slowed attitude. Too many drugs, I thought. Great. Still, I let him in my car, and agreed to drive him as far as he wanted south, telling him I was just on a road trip, going where the road took me. I figured that kind of washy answer would suffice for someone of his nature, and it appeared I was right, as he seemed to accept my explanation. We started off and drove for a good while without incident. He talked and I responded minimally, but enough to keep him going. Eventually, he pulled out a joint and asked if I minded. I did, but considering the circumstances, I told him I didn't, and he lit up while I kept an eye on the road. It was by now completely dark, no moon in the sky which made the darkness even more inky, and I kept my focus on the road markings. 
Just because there were supernatural monsters chasing me didn't mean I still couldn't get collected by a moose or something, though that would be ironic. I took us down a seldom used back road and felt my heart begin to race as my headlights finally fell on a dark figure ahead of us as it came into view. I wasn't surprised, just nervous as I slowed the car to a stop. Standing in the middle of the road were the two riders. The horse closest to the car snorted and pawed the ground impatiently, its hoof scraping on the asphalt as the flesh hanging off its legs shook and flapped around from the movement. I was fairly sure a piece of the rotting skin would slop off at any moment if it continued. The hitchhiker I'd picked up leaned forward in his seat to get a better look of what was in front of us. At first he seemed confused, just staring at them before looking at the joint in his hand and muttering something about it being strong shit and not knowing what the hell was in it. I took a deep breath. This was perhaps the only time I could have almost been thankful for the smoke filling the car as I told him simply, get out. He seemed startled when I spoke, then unsure of himself. But man, we're in the middle of nowhere, and I'm seeing some weird things, he complained. I don't care. Get out, I repeated with more authority. To which he, of course, protested further. I started to worry that he wasn't going to do as I asked, and before I knew what I was going to do, I had grabbed the Glock out of the glove box and pointed it at him. I said, get out, I growled. Having a gun in his face seemed to sober him up quickly as he looked out at the gruesome creatures and then back at me. Seriously, dude? He asked, his voice starting to tremble with pure terror. Now, I specified, ignoring his question and repositioning the gun to let him know I was indeed serious. Uh, okay, man, just calm down, he told me but did finally pop the door handle and step out of the car. Shut the door, I instructed, while keeping my gaze fixed on him rather than looking at the creatures. Obediently, he did as he was told, and I immediately locked the doors behind him. At this point, he seemed to realize what was going to happen and tried to get back in despite having heard the doors lock. However, he became entirely more frantic when I began to back the car away. He shouted and begged to let me back in while trailing after the car, but I only gripped the steering wheel harder and ignored his pleading. The horses began to advance as my headlights receded and I hoped my plan would work. I reversed further, turning the wheel and put the handbrake on rapidly, allowing the car to slide around until I faced the direction I was originally coming from. Then just drove off. I didn't look back. I drove the entire rest of the night all the way home, but they weren't following me. My plan had worked that night, and I knew what I had to do from then on. It's been years now since then, and I get to spend every day with my kids. I even managed to repair the relationship my ex and I had. We got remarried and I live with my new family again. We got remarried and I live with my family again. I have also returned to trucking. I think it gives my wife a little break for me when I take long trips and enjoy the freedom of the open road. I also willingly pick up hitchhikers nowadays. I don't force anyone to take a ride with me. If they say no, I just move on to the next. But those who do get a ride get the best ride of their lives. I let them listen to whatever they want. If they want to smoke or whatever, that's fine too. And if they're hungry, I'll even pay for whatever meal they want. It's the least I can do. I don't bother to learn their names. That's been far too many of them now for me to remember or even pretend to care to know their names. It's unnecessary. I've gotten better at getting them out of my truck without too much of a fuss, though. Usually I give them lots of water to drink and wait for them to say they need to stop. I don't like doing this, but I have to. For my children, Gracie has just graduated high school and soon she'll be going to college. She's going to be a nurse. She's always been such a kind girl. Lachlan isn't so academically minded, but he's great at his sports. Even says he wants to join the army like his old man. I really couldn't be more proud of him. The riders let me know when it's time to get them another tribute. I know because that's when I hear them the loudest. Normally they're just a dull sound at the back of my mind, but when they want something, they're almost deafening.
There have been a couple close calls over the years where I thought I wasn't going to find anyone in time, but I don't regret what I've done. Every one of them did choose to get into my truck. All I really did was make an offer. Though I must say, I don't know if I can keep up the supply to meet the demands of volunteers alone anymore. The riders seem to come to me sooner and sooner, demanding another sacrifice. There's going to be some tough times ahead, so I'll warn you now. If you're out there, walking alone, I'm going to take that as a willingness to help the cause. I simply can't be held accountable for your poor choices. Similarly, if you're someone who's looking to get a free ride across the country, you've always known you should be careful. You can't blame me for what happens next when you were warned. After all, you never know whose vehicle you're getting into. I've been locked alone in here for over a year. Until today, that is. I'm not locked in here against my will. Oh no. I locked myself in here. Where is here exactly? Here is a bunker that I constructed over the last 10 years. I started it back in 52 and I finished it just before those damn commies put those missiles in Cuba. After that happened, I knew I had to save myself before something terrible happened, so I grabbed all that I could and locked myself underground. I know they launched those missiles, because I haven't heard any sort of movement outside of here in months. Ever since then, I've been in here, waiting, and waiting, until it's safe to return to the surface. My bunker sits a hundred feet underground, only one way out, through a hatch in the top, and through a long tunnel with only a ladder inside. And I've been alone this entire time, until now. Just last night, someone came knocking on the hatch. I ignored it at first. I thought I was hearing things, because it was so far away. But they haven't let up for three days. Every morning, he comes back and starts back up again. I've been listening to that wretched banging for three days. I wasn't going to open it because I knew if I let anyone else in, then I wouldn't have enough supplies to go around for more than one. But I felt bad that someone might actually be alive out there and needed my help. But I can't stand that noise anymore. It's been relentless. He must be yelling too, because sometimes it'll stop for ten seconds or so and then start over again. Finally, when I couldn't last any longer and I felt my head was going to explode, I I cracked. I made the ascent up to the hatch and listened closely. The man was yelling to let him in between the banging. I couldn't help but feel pity for the man, and some caution because he might have just been out to take the things that I've worked so hard to achieve. Then I thought about how lonely I've been, how long I've gone without human contact, and, well, I couldn't resist it any longer. I gave in to temptation and yelled back at the man. I yelled to the man. I'm going to open the hatch and to move back. I turned the wheel and through the heavy door open to see a man standing in the dirt next to the opening. His fists bloodied and broken from the constant banging. He wasn't a very physically imposing man, but not a small man to be sure. I eyed him with suspicion, but he looked so relieved that I opened the door that I couldn't help but feel like I did something good. How did you survive out here so long? I inquired, still eyeing the man, my body half in the ground, half out. What do you mean? There's no danger out here, he responded a little confused. What do you mean? Those missiles in Cuba are still there? War hasn't broken out? War hasn't broken out? I asked, confused, because if the bombs hadn't been dropped, why is the noise of traffic stopped months ago? Why has the radio signal been dead? Why was it always so quiet? Oh no, there's a war, but it doesn't involve the bombs. The Northeast has been evacuated and I came back to look for some things I left out here, he said, gesturing towards a group of cabins nearby. I'm assuming you didn't find what you were looking for, I said, looking at his empty hands. No, nobody there. 
I headed back when I found the plans of dear little shelter in the basement of one of those cabins, and I came only to find it locked. Why do you want to get in? There's no bombs out there, what's the point coming down here? I asked, leaning closer. Can we talk about this inside? I don't think it's safe out here. Okay, I'll go down first so I can keep an eye on you, I said. Turn the wheel and close the hatch when you enter. The man entered and I descended the rungs of the ladder until I reached the very bottom, keeping my eyes on him the whole time. I opened the door. When I reached the bottom and stepped to my shelter, the stranger was right behind me and he closed the door as he walked in and then sat down at one of the chairs in the kitchen. I sat across from him and we both sat in silence for a moment. Then I asked him once again. So, what's about to happen? I asked, looking at the stranger. So you really don't know? The Soviets are invading. And if they lose the invasion, then... The bombs are going off, no doubt. They're invading? I repeated shockingly. That's what the government says anyway. And they've evacuated the entire south and northwest. They haven't gotten here yet? I asked inquisitively. I don't think they're really invading. I haven't heard so much as a peep since coming out here. And not even our own military out here. I think they called the invasion off or we beat them and our government hasn't told us yet. They're always lying, and why would the Soviets invade if they had rockets? They would lose too many men to an invasion. It's not worth it to them. But better safe than sorry, am I right? He said with a grin on his face. I knew I needed to get in soon, and who would have known it's been occupied? Do you have any communication with the outside world down here? Radio's been silent for months. I don't even have it on anymore, I said, still letting the stranger's story sink in. Well, there's not much here, so I don't need to give you the grand tour. Now that we're splitting rations, I only have food for a few more months at least. After that, then, well, we'll deal with that when we come to it. I explained to the man, both of us sitting still in the kitchen chairs. We don't need to wait that long. We can leave here sooner once we know for sure there's no invasion. The man said matter of fact. We both continued sitting there the man letting the new atmosphere of the place sink in. In my mind, I was glad that someone else was here with me, but I couldn't help but feel slightly suspicious of the newcomer. I hadn't spoken to another soul in months, so I just shrugged it off as anxiety for a change in my routine. We continued with the routine of living underground for the next couple of months. We rarely talked and just sat around doing pointless tasks to pass the time, but every time we talked, he always brought up the possibility that it was a false alarm and that the surface was clear. But I wasn't about to risk everything I had worked for to be destroyed by the chance it was safe. When he wasn't talking about the surface being safe, he would be talking about all the government's lies and how they've been manipulative. It was really starting to get to me. He ate more food than I did, but I never complained. I just acted like I didn't notice, and my resentment for him slowly grew. If he kept this up, we'd be out of supplies in a matter of weeks. Now I avoided talking to him because I would always return to the topic of the surface. Chances are if we returned to the surface we'd be met with a nuclear wasteland or staring down the barrels of Soviet rifles. Every time he thought we should return and I dismissed him, he brought it up later again. And again and again. Finally I snapped and we got into an argument about the whole thing. The solitude was starting to get to me and I let it out on him. I've been alone with that man for four months now. Now we just go along our routine. Some days speaking, some days speaking nothing. And the silence. Oh, the silence. It's the kind of silence that you can hear. It sounds like nothing, yet it makes the loudest noise. I can't take it anymore. I need a change, and I'll be damned if he ruins everything for me. Nothing ever changes down here. Even our daily conversations. He still brings up the topic of returning to the surface. I feel like he's trying to get rid of me, trying to steal everything that I've got for himself. That's why he's talking about the surface so much. That's why he's always going on. He's out to get me, because he wants it all to himself. The other day, we really got into it. We were in the living room, and he tried to bring it up again, and I responded with a smart retort. 
If you believe all the shit you say, then why the hell are you still here? I asked him in an aggressive tone. Because I don't want to be out there alone. Why don't you come with me? He asked. The hell I am. There's no telling what could be up there, and I sure don't want to be up there with you. I yelled in response. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? If that's the case, why are you down here with me? He asked, standing up and steeping towards me. What? You're the one who's down here with me. This is my place, and all you've done is take advantage of my hospitality. You won't shut the fuck up about all the lies and cover-ups done by the government, and you actually believe that shit. You're going to get us both killed if you keep trying to leave. Oh, so you're some gracious host, then. If you didn't want me down here, then why would you let me in in the first place? We're going to have to leave sometime, and you know it. When that day comes, you won't turn my offer down, he said as he stormed out of the living room and into the bunk room. Now, I know he's trying to lure me out. He has never made an offer other than come up with him. I don't know what that whack job had planned, but I'm not falling for his shit. I'm not going to let him leave and endanger us both. I should have never let him into the first place. And I regret it every day. Every night I don't sleep out of fear that he's going to try something, and now I see signs of him planning it everywhere. He sounds suspicious. Every time I see him, he looks suspicious. Oh, how I'd love to get rid of his parasite and have my place all to myself once again. I can see it now. Things back to the way it used to be. The peace and quiet I once despised. I now longed for more than anything. At this moment in life, there wasn't very much I wouldn't do to fulfill that desire. The next day, we ran out of food. He lost it again. We got into another argument and he stormed off again, even angrier than the last time. And once again, my resentment grew to full-blown hate. Everything that was wrong I found in a way in my mind depended on him. Maybe it was being confined in that space for the better part of a year or how little I communicate with the only other inhabitant, but I started to get restless. He gave me weird looks now and, and we hadn't spoken since the argument. He's going to do it soon because of the food problem. He's getting desperate. So now I wait for him to make his move and I would make him regret it. Oh, I can't wait for it to happen. Finally, an excuse to rid myself of this freeloader. The night following the day we ran out of supplies, I sat in bed thinking about this man's story. If the Soviets were invading, then why didn't he just walk back to our lines and get back to civilization? It didn't add up. He was hiding something. A reason for why he didn't want to go back to the rest of the country, but he didn't want to stay underground. Every day, my trust for the man wanes more and more. I started keeping a knife on me, wherever I went. I was afraid that he'd try something so he could leave. Whenever he was asleep, I would quietly sharpen the blade, telling myself how I can't wait to use it on the bastard. I could imagine plunging it into him and hearing the quiet once again. The piercing noise of silence. Every day I fought the temptation to use it on him. Oh, how hard it was to resist the urge, but I knew the day would come. Soon, soon I could enjoy the silence again. The next night he snuck out of the beds and tried to make a break for it. I was ready for him, though. I knew this was going to happen tonight, so I stayed up and waited for him to try it. He left the room and made a break toward the door to the ladder. I jumped out of bed, grabbed the knife out of my pillowcase, and ran after him. He had to slow down to open the door, and even though the room was twenty feet across, I closed the distance between us in no time at all and tackled the man from behind. Get the fuck off me! I'm getting out of here! He yelled, trying to throw me off of him. You don't know what you're doing! You're going to kill us both. I yelled as I pinned him down and stabbed the knife downwards in an arc towards his chest. He saw the blade and tried to roll to the side, and I brought... And the blade caught him in the side. The knife was lodged in between his ribs, so I resorted to my fist and started throwing punches towards his face. One punch landed squarely on his nose and I felt it crack beneath my hand and a hot blood squirted all over my fist and his face. He yelled, turned over, and kicked me off. He lunged for the ladder and tried to make his way up, yelling in pain from the knife lodged in his side. I climbed on the ladder as well and tried to grab his leg, but he kicked down and landed a hit squarely in the forehead. He kept going, and I kept going. He made it to the top, and I was right behind him. As he diverted his attention to the hatch, I reached up and grabbed his feet and pulled it through the rungs that were slippery from his blood. 
He let out a cry as he lost his balance and fell backwards down the shaft of the tunnel and plummeted towards the bottom. I heard him hit the sides on his way down, and he landed with a sickening crunch at the bottom of the ladder. I climbed down, making sure not to slip on the man's blood, which now stained the walls of the space as well. I reached the bottom of the ladder and saw the man's lifeless body, bent and broken, laying in a heap at the foot of the ladder. He was dead. And come to think of it, I never even knew his name. I had to do it, though. He would have killed me. But now that he was gone, the silence was back. Oh, the dreaded silence, so loud and so quiet all at once. I walked into the living room and reclined in a chair and just listened. And I swear I heard the sound of cars. Not just cars, but the sound of people, too. I must have been hallucinating. There was no way. I listened harder, straining myself to hear. And sure enough, there it was. The sounds of people talking. I followed the sound back up the ladder, slippery with blood, and to the base of the hatch. The voices were louder now. It sounded like someone was yelling. I grabbed the hatch and turned it and threw open the heavy door once again. Outside, it was bright and sunny, and nearby, the highway was littered with cars and two people arguing over a flat tire on the side of the road. He was right. He was an honest man who hadn't lied to me. His theory was right, and I killed him for it. And I enjoyed what I had done, because now I once again live in relative peace and quiet.